glimpse of the kingdom. I am David Pendergrass, and today I have a special guest with me. Her name is Elaine. She's my wife. That was a dramatic pause. <laughs> she didn't say anything. She just smiled at me because she's being sweet. I had a, We had a question. I had a question, and uh, we were going to cover it a little bit together today. There's a question from a listener, and she said, I wanted to reach out to ask for some advice with an issue my daughter is dealing with. She's just turned 12, and she has a friend at school who is not a Christian that has recently told her mom and her friends that she is bisexual. This was somewhat surprising to me for her to say things like this at the age of 12, but this particular girl seems to have a lot of issues, so I mainly chalked it up to that, that in my mind. But recently, she has told other kids that she has a crush on my daughter. My daughter seems to be trying to brush it off and not to let it get to her. She seems to just laugh about it, but I'm struggling with how to talk to my daughter about it. I waver between not wanting to freak out and make a big deal of it and wanting to step in and try to keep my daughter away from the other girl. They both have recently been invited to a birthday party sleepover at another friend's house, and I'm struggling with how to handle it. And she'd be interested in my thoughts and some other things. Now, I've already responded to this question because it was, I guess, about a month ago now because I got to it right away. I'd have a chance to do a podcast. But I thought I'd follow up on, and to that question and talk about what I said, and my wife's going to chime in here a little bit first. The first thing I'd say to her is, I have several things. We'll kind of reflect here together. One thing is, is to make sure, parents, that if you haven't already, you need to talk immediately. You need to talk to your parents, your children immediately about sex, about sexual attraction. You, you need to. If you don't feel prepared for that whatsoever, and I don't mean just anxious. I'll talk about that in a second. But just prepare like you need data. Then go read some good books on that. There are numerous good books on that. Also, there's a blog that my wife has. I called. just did a video about this called Teach on Teaching Kids About God, which is ElainePendergrass.com. I just did a video of how to talk to your kids about Hot sex. off the video presses. ElainePendergrass.com. How to teach kids. Well, it's just called. How to talk to your kids about yeah, sex. How to talk to kids about sex. So there's all kinds of ways you can get your data in there. And I'm really mean this. And I know for a lot of people, I know this. I, I know this. For a lot of people, talking about sex with their children is a very awkward, mm-hmm. anxiety-producing thing. But the first thing is to get the data. When you get enough data to go, okay, I'm going to use the words that matter like penis and sex and orientation and attraction and the word sex, the word sex, the word, the words just say practice it the saying it. Say in the mirror, look at yourself, <laughs> say in the dark, the light on. Uh, say the word penis, say the word vulva, vagina, get used to saying these words. If you lose yourself <laughs> uncontrollably laughing or whatever it is and you're talking to your child, it's okay to laugh. It is okay to laugh. And say, I'm uncomfortable too. These are yeah. funny things to talk about. But, but if you can't reality. talk about it and you have to make up words like cuckoo, woo-woo, poo-poo, <laughs> peep, all these kind of... Ki- it shows then that uh, sex is always something to be childish about, and it is not, stuff. and embarrassed of, and ashamed of, and when I talk to mom or dad, they freaked out, I'm never going to do that again. So it sets a bad precedence. So my first tip is get the data. Number two is once you have the data, it does help you feel not as anxious. Mm-hmm. But you just, sim- if you are the parent listening and you feel very anxious about this conversation, you ha- one encouragement is you have to think of the benefit on the other side of it. Grow up. You need to grow up and get over it. Your child needs you, mm-hmm. period. So get over yourself, get over your anxiety, get over your panic attacks about this discussion. I mean, that not literally a panic attack. You need to see a therapist if you really have a panic attack about this issue. But this is something that you know is crippling. You need to get over it. Get over yourself. Your child needs it. Your child will learn about this mm-hmm. from someone <laughs> first. It's going to be Timmy in class. It's going to be a porn video. It's going to be a magazine. It's going to be... Fifth grade boys, fourth grade, third grade girls. So you've got to wake up if you haven't already. You need immediately. All over TV. TV, YouTube. Even things like Disney and Nickelodeon. Yeah, Nickelodeon. Now Arthur has a gay teacher. Do you see that? Arthur on PBS. It's like the 12th season. They've had his teacher forever. No, he is. Mr. Ratfield. Yeah, he's gay. Oh, well, they They never said that before. They did now. The opening season just happened. Wow. And it's called uh, Mr. Ratfield's. Ratfield. Ratfield's special friend or something. Aww. And on season one, it comes that out as he's like married that. a man. They're all over it. So Disney, the, they have, I think it's Disney. They have, um, you know, gay parents. I mean, it's all over. It's not hard to see. So sexuality so, is just out so there. So Christians, we, Christian parents, we have to, we just have to, we have to do it. So get the data, then get over your anxiety enough to do the right thing and, and have talks to them for sure. And find out the Christian view of what it means to have sex. 
It is not the Christian view that you see on the media. To have sex with whoever you want to, whenever you want to, one night stands or boyfriends, everybody lives together before they get married, it's all over. That is not the Christian stance. And this is one of those things where parents, you're just going to have to stand up against what society teaches. It's going to sound weird and awkward to tell your children that the the Christian example is to not have sex before you're married to a male or a female, the opposite of your gender. That's going to seem weird. But hopefully it's very normal to them because they grew up that way. Otherwise, society tells them, do whatever you want with whomever you want. And that is not the Christian example. Exactly right. You articulate it right off the bat. It's okay to teach your kids that there are different beliefs and different practices amongst Christians and non-Christians. Just make it normal. It's not a way to demonstrate that you're all so much better and that you never sent. It's just a way of making it very clear that there's a distinction. And, you know, heaven forbid, read the Bible, read Mark chapter 10, read Matthew 19, read Genesis 1, whatever. But I like to go to Jesus first. And as you go to Jesus, and Jesus in the context of divorce told us that God the Father's design in the very beginning was that man and woman be together in marriage. He designed us. He designed us what to do with our money, what to do with our mouth, what to do with our hands and feet, what to do with our eyes, and what to do with our genitalia. He gets to decide what was best for life. And if you trust him, you trust him that he's not an idiot and he's not evil. And if he's not an idiot and he's not evil, but in, instead the most intelligent, kind, loving, conceivable being, then we trust him. We trust him that his way is the right way. Now, we're not going the whole subject right now about, well, what if they fail? We, yes, yeah. there's grace. My I goodness. That in my video. All, yeah, the video. Of course, there's all kinds of grace and forgiveness. Sure. Well, I'm not, right now, we're just trying to emphasize when they're young mm-hmm. enough that we're just trying to set bare standards. This is the standard. This is what we're supposed to be doing. And then we draw a distinction. Notice how that's not what you see in movies, right? Mm-hmm. Timmy or Susie, that's not what we see all the time. And every single movie and TV show I've ever seen, and every couple I've ever met, is what you're supposed to do is date, have sex. If you're drunk or kind of drink a little bit, you have sex as quickly as possible. But you might have a normal relationship for about two or three dates. You have sex. If the sex is good, you keep and the person have sex. You have sex for a few months. Then you might move in together. And then maybe years from now, if you want to, maybe get married. And, or, or you also may have mm-hmm. children. They may have to get married. Yeah. If you feel a little extra guilt or shame, well, they tell everything to me that everything is backwards. So we'll reverse mm-hmm. all of that. And Anyway, the, I know the, the listener who wrote into this, I think she's already had these conversations. But my mm-hmm. first step is if you, that's got to be ground zero. So that, so that when these issues of bisexuality, homosexuality, bestiality, whatever, the, I don't care what the issue comes up, they're going to hear about these things. Sexual attraction. Period. Sexual attraction. When they come up, if you've already had these conversations uh, and you've taught your children you're a safe place to go to and you don't freak out and you don't do all this crazy stuff, yeah. uh, then they're going to be more open to talk about it. Yeah. I'm so glad that her daughter came to her and talked to her about that's it. I mean, outstanding. That's outstanding. Yeah, outstanding. That says that she trusts her and all of that. Outstanding. So a couple tips about this particular issue, a couple thoughts. One thing is that if if you're listening to this and you've not had exposure to homosexuality, bisexuality, and your own family and your own close friendship, uh, if well, let me say it this way: if you're a person who has had that, you might not understand what it's like for those who have not. Mm-hmm. So it is very unnerving. It is new. It is different. Uh, some people think it is disgusting and icky and surreal and whatever. There's all kinds of words that come along with it. Most people, when they're first exposed to this, especially when it comes to their children, it is not a warm, comforting feeling of, oh, that's no big different like ordering pizza. It's, it's a different kind of thing. So my first encouragement is own that. Just own it emotionally that some people have have adjustment period like, oh, my goodness, really? Or really? Or what about this? I don't understand. And there's a little bit of shock factor and all these things. And that's just it is. And that's so just own it. Doesn't mean you're a sinner. It just means you're human and you have, for whatever reason, you've got various emotional responses to it. OK, well, you do. And you don't have to tell your children that it just means I'm telling you the parent. Just own it. Just go, you know what? This is how I feel about that. Or I'm not sure how I feel about that yet. Well, think about it and process it. Feel it. Talk to a spouse if you can or a good friend if you can. If you need to, journal, pray, but process your feeling. The second thing I'd say is when it comes to any of these issues about bisexuality, homosexuality, whatever sexuality, I would not presume that the other person is immediately going to jump your child's bones. Mm -hmm. Now, it is true amongst homosexuals, and that's typically reserved for the male, and study after study demonstrates this, homosexuals, male gay people, tend to have a very, very high uh, view of uh, sex drive. Of course, the testosterone. You get two guys with testosterone together. They really do, they're flagrantly, overtly physical. Studies demonstrate more than females tend to be, tend to be. 
So, but nevertheless, I don't assume because a person has an alternate sexual orientation than heterosexual that somehow they're an immediate physical threat to your child. Mm -hmm. I would not assume that. Instead, what I would assume, what I would presume and what I'd act like is that that other person, whatever their gender identity, whatever that dysphoria is, whatever their attraction or dysphoria is, whatever it is, treat them just like you would an opposite sex, opposite gender person. So if a girl says, and this has happened uh, at my daughter's classes and my son, the class, he knows people, this has happened, you know, you just treat them like the opposite sex. So this girl who calls herself bisexual, treat her like a boy in any kind of normal boundary situation. So you have normal physical boundaries. And so you would talk to her. You would talk to your daughter. I'll call her Susie. I don't know what her name is. Susie, if uh, if Betty... Does she treat you weirdly? Well, yeah, she kind of acts real sweet to me, and she says she likes me. Okay, does she do anything to you? What do you mean, does she do anything? Well, does she touch you ever? Does she hug you long time? Does she hug you, or does that make you uncomfortable? Or does she... You just... You have a conversation about those kind of physical things. And you listen to it, and you act normal. You look at it, hmm, okay, whatever. Remember, the whole time you're treating this like if a boy were to do this. Now, my tip is, and this is based off what Paul says to Timothy... The Apostle Paul, that is. The Apostle Paul says to Timothy, now it's a little different context, but the principle, I think, is fairly good as a principle in Christianity, and that is you treat older lady like mothers, you treat younger and daughters, women like sisters. So in general, you want to treat that your daughter, is it Susie, that's the name I gave her? (laughs) Tell Susie, tell Susie to treat girls like their sisters and boys like their brothers. That would be a normal physical reaction. So if this girl is acting like a boy, that is, she is attracted to your daughter, treated like a boy then. That is, what would you do to a brother? So if this girl comes up and gives her a side hug, that's what a brother might do, or a pat on the back, sure. But if this girl comes up and hugs and hugs and hugs, that's usually not what brothers do. And I mean usually. But that's how I would treat it. You have strong physical boundaries. By strong, I don't mean mean. I just mean firm physical boundaries. And you teach your daughter that. What you don't do is teach your daughter how to get the other girl to stop Mm -hmm. because you can't control that and you don't need to do all that and make sure worry like any second she's going to be accosted unless she has reason to think she's really going to be accosted which means you need to call the police or something but outside of that you just teach her how to have safe boundaries that's the same with the sleepover when it comes to the sleepover you have strong physical boundaries i would never let a boy sleep over with my daughter ever but if there were a group of them together well sure i would i did that as a kid we had group sleep outs when you had 10, 12 on both sides, or we had youth lock-ins together where the boys and girls were all there. They had sleeping together, but they had separate, they had separate areas. And if they didn't watch the movie, they were still fairly close together. But you had chaperones. You just, you know, keep your hands to yourself and so forth. That's exactly what I would do with that girl. But I would teach your daughter for that. I wouldn't make sure. I mean, there's no need to call all the other parents and say, don't let your daughter touch. To me, that would be overwhelmingly too much. Mm-hmm. The issue is teaching your daughter and your son, whomever, you know, to whomever this could apply, Teach them how to how no one should ever be touching them at all outside of a doctor anyway or a mom and dad in appropriate areas. So, and sleepovers and things like that, of course, bring different situations. So, changing clothes, obviously, and not obviously, maybe, but your daughter should probably not change clothes around that other person. If she's attracted to her, then that's not a good thing. Just like she wouldn't change clothes around a boy. Using the bathroom, don't have the same person in the bathroom. That's right, just know. like being um, a boy. Yeah, so just so if, you're, those, if she has a swim party, you yeah. don't put on a swimsuit like she wouldn't change in front of right. a boy. You ever. And that's where it can get tricky, like in locker rooms and things like that. But just be aware that that person's around. She may not be the only one that's attracted to females and males. Um, just be aware of that. But at the same time, you don't want to change your way. If some, if I'm in the locker room at the gym and some girl sees me changing, it doesn't mean she wants to jump me. That's not it. It's just I need to be you know guarded. Just be aware of that. Same thing about um, with guys. So just have her be aware of that. But yeah, I think that's important just to keep those boundaries. If the girl acts toward her, does something that makes her uncomfortable, it's okay to say no. Say that makes me uncomfortable or don't touch me or whatever. I don't imagine that happening, um, especially when they're just friends and the, the girl is 12. I can't imagine that happening. But if it did, she needs to learn to say no, just like if a boy touched her in a way that made her uncomfortable. Also to use chaperones, if something happens, you tell an adult. Um, things that we would do, we would teach our children about the opposite sex or if an an older adult touches them or whatever it is that we say no and we tell an adult. So those are a few tips. That's there. exactly right. And those, if someone, if that, that's a good thing to teach them too. If they were ever touched an old, a grown up or a person, a child, boy, girl, dog, it doesn't matter. It's teach them, you role play and you teach them 
What would you say if someone what what would you say if someone kept staring at you? You role play right then. What would you say if someone come up and try to touch you there? What would you say? What would you do? What would you tell the person if they came up and tried to X Y Z? And something as simple as no, don't do that. I don't feel comfortable when you do that is good enough. No, don't do that. I don't feel comfortable when you do that. Now, if you do it to a person who's gay, bisexual, whatever, then they're oh you, oh you're homophobic. Oh you hate gay people. You look them in the face and say. It's my body. I don't feel comfortable doing that. You don't have the right to my body to touch it. It's my body. Just you be real firm about it. You teach them that. And I'll have them practice doing it and have them mm-hmm. practice saying it firm. No, it's my body. You don't have the right to my body. I don't care what your orientation is. It's my body. It's not your body. It's my body. Just have them practice it over and over and over. I don't feel comfortable with that. And if the person ever really does feel uncomfortable, of course, they call you right away. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is a worst case scenario. I mean, that's, but and it can happen. Teaching, even teaching those nuances when people try to rub against you and they accidentally, you know, swipe your breast or something like that. Those things, too. Even talk about sometimes people try to do that. I mean, typically it might be in a guy situation toward a girl, um, but not necessarily. So if those kinds of things happen, it's okay to say no, call them on it, say stop. I don't like that. That is important. And it's important not. It, it's what's common what the standard rea- reaction that people will have is giggling mm-hmm. and that's because they're nervous that's a very standard reaction to being anxious of course is to laugh but if you laugh toward the person they will not see anxiety they will see they enjoyed it Mixed signals. Mm-hmm. and so as much as possible they need to furrow their brow look serious and have a hard boundary no don't do that again that makes you feel uncomfortable not ha 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 stop ha 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 because what's going to get back to everybody is, well, she was laughing. She liked it. Now, it doesn't, for one billionth of a second, mean they deserve it. I'm just saying. Mm. So you practice it. You practice going, that that's your body. It's it's okay to be, it's okay in that moment to act frustrated. It's okay in the moment to act angry because you can be. That's perfectly acceptable. And another thing about the attraction, you know, there our bodies react physically and emotionally when we're attracted to something, someone, you know, when you get excited about something that's upcoming, your heart rate may elevate, you can get warm, you want to smile, those sorts of things. In the same way, when we have sexual attraction, certain things happen. When we feel like someone is handsome or someone is beautiful or someone touches you in a certain way, that's what our body does. And so it's important to realize that and to talk to your children about it. It can be a strange situation when your daughter maybe gets sexually excited and her she starts to get wet around her vagina or it feels pressure because the blood is rushing or your son begins to get an erection because he gets excited. Those things happen when our body is stimulated or when our mind is stimulated about sexual things. So that w- that's where it can get confusing when kids are molested and things because they'll say sometimes, well, you enjoyed it because their body reacts. Well, that's not an enjoyment thing necessarily. The only reason I bring that up is because it can be confusing, I imagine, for kids and for adults when they might see maybe it's a female and she sees a beautiful female or she's showing a lot of cleavage or something and they be, their body begins to react. It doesn't mean that she's gay. It doesn't mean that she's necessarily attracted to other females, but it means that her body reacted because she saw something beautiful that's sexual. Same for males. And so I think that attraction is important to talk about with your children, to tell them what their bodies do and that whole conversation about your penis and your vagina and your vulva and this is what happens and lubrication because of sex. I mean, that makes sense. And if they don't know that at the time when their bodies do that, they'll be, oh, what's, what's going on here? And it feels like something's wrong. Um, but if you explain that to them and they have that exposure, that's really good. So when kids in particular, this girl is 12 saying she's bisexual, I don't know that she's bisexual. She might just have a relationship that's strained with females, not a good relationship. And she sees another female and feels safe or, or she sees someone thinks she's beautiful. And she thinks that that means she likes her physically or sexually. What? Absolutely. And I know you don't mean this, but just to be clear on this, it doesn't mean your daughter's job is to tell this other girl why she feels the way she does, the why she thinks she the way she does. Oh my goodness, it's not. You, you just don't need to do that at all. So what could you do about that? Well, if your daughter asks about those things, well, then you can be a phenomenal Christian example. You say, we're going to pray for her. We'll pray that whatever God wants her to learn and to be, in his great wisdom, she will experience it because he loves her and will pray that she comes to love Jesus with all her heart, soul, strength, and mind, and that her parents and family will as well. 
especially if they're not a Christian, that they come to know Jesus, they come to know Jesus. I, I would encourage your children to keep talking about come to know Jesus more than they would talk about her sexuality. And this is, as you most people know and get this, but we now live in a culture, it's very different. I, this sounds like I'm an old mom on my day, but it was different back in our grandparents' day. But And that it is this, now almost everything is about sexuality. It's who I am, it's who I am. We have to work very hard to teach our children, no, that's not who you are. And it's not what this girl is. Mm -hmm. This girl is not a bisexual. This girl is a is a child of God. She's born in the image of God. And our sexuality is almost certainly a mixture, an amalgam of both biochemical reactions in our brain and also cultural uh, input, input by the nurturing. So this nature versus nurture is almost certainly a false dichotomy. It's probably both. Nevertheless, your daughter doesn't have to fix that, and you as a mom don't have to fix that. We need to help these people get to know Jesus. And ideally, if they give their life to Jesus, then ideally, they give to Jesus all of themselves, regardless of what their impulses might say on the inside. To be a disciple of Jesus means we surrendered our impulses to him. We, we act on or don't act on certain impulses, depending on whether Jesus taught it. So that's what they should talk about. And if your daughter gets in the conversation with these kids and say, oh, you're just scared of this, you're homophobic, that's another thing you can teach them. That's what you didn't ask about in the podcast. That's another thing you get to teach your kids about is how to talk about the Christian worldview. And again, just to reiterate, the goal of the Christian worldview to outsiders, to non-Christians, is not to try to fix them up, get them clean, get them, get them ready. That is not your job. Your job is to do your best job you can to talk about Jesus and lead them to Jesus and act like Jesus. That's it. Let him do all the cleaning, all the fixing, all the working. <laughs> and in the meantime, we're as kind as we can. But it's in, in your kindness, have firm boundaries. And that's it. And that's, I mean, that's prepares them for reality for life. They're going to be a teenager, then university, perhaps or at least that age. And then adult, it's never going to stop. They're going to make decisions all the time around this kind of stuff. So that, that's what I would say. <laughs> well, best wishes. Uh, God bless you. Don't forget to check out ElainePendergrass.com and check out her stuff there. I think it might help you out. God bless. Well, the conversation isn't finished. You can always reach out to me on social media. Are you on Facebook? I am too. At Glimpse of the Kingdom. Glimpse of the Kingdom on Facebook. Be sure to like it and you can see updates there. Also, if you're on Twitter, check me out at, at Dr. D. Pendergrass. At Dr. D. Pendergrass. Or at glimpse the king at glimpse the king and i try my best to respond to comments and questions on there as quickly as i can if you want more there are many more resources on the podcast and my blog go to my website davidpendergrass.com davidpendergrass.com and you can see a full list of the podcast and my blog is available for free are you active in a church right now i'd be happy to come out to your church and do all kinds of classes and workshops there Check out davidpendergrass.com, davidpendergrass.com for more information. And may God in his great grace give you even just a glimpse of his kingdom this week. See you next time.